Are there children? They'll learn sooner or later. We gotta tell them now. Uh, I, I have a really long history in sales and marketing and promotion, which did actually suit me to do this. I ran nightclubs. I had this. I had to basically. I started venues. Doug Fur, Mississippi Studios, all these crazy places. Right when Facebook was beginning, mm -hmm. and so I got to kind of come up with that whole thing, or not, I mean, like just dealing with that whole thing, and creating a venue and like sort of a, a you know a, a place for this uh, venue to be in people's heads, and like how do you connect it all with social media? So I was sort of an early adopter in promoting and trying to get people's attention, and then when crowdfunding came out, I was like, yeah, this is amazing, but you know. At the end of the day, when you're trying to fund your thing, it really, like, I would love to say that my whole cast and crew helped me, and they do a little, but it's really me. Mm -hmm. Like, you you as the artist, you're the engine. Mm -hmm. You are the engine. And I'll tell you one thing that was the suckiest thing about crowdfunding. Uh -huh. I've, got, I've got, like, tons of horror stories. But, um, well, one, one, we started crowdfunding for the most recent uh, season of Benefits of Death Wondry, literally one week after the election. Uh, which wasn't very fun. Like, you think crowdfunding generally is hard? Try doing it when everybody's really depressed and doesn't want to even talk to you, let alone, like, they're giving money, they're giving it to the ACLU or Planned And they should be. And they should be, especially a week after because they're all terrified, but I still had to do it. There was no turning it back. We had already set the wheels in motion. We thought we'd be living in a different world. Oops. And, you know, and so then I had to find a way, because believe me, at that point, none of my cast and crew were helping me at all. Yeah. So like in a normal crowdfunding campaign, you can really engage the people that work with you to utilize their networks to help build your network bigger, which is what you should be doing. But worst case scenario, you crowdfund like an asshole a week after the election, <laughs> and you try really hard to, you know, to get every person you know to care. Yeah. Now, the, the thing, that, it, it did work, we did get through it, but I oddly, it was the second time we crowdfunded on this project, on Death Wondry, and both times I wanted to, to raise $25,000. Which doesn't seem unreasonable if you think about our project. You're like, wow, you get depressed. It's out there. This is a real thing. Like, I know what this is. Twenty-five thousand dollars is really hard. Both times. This is just. I'm just going to be real with you guys. Like, both times we've reduced it to fifteen. Both times. And both times I had one of my husbands give me over five thousand dollars to make that fifteen. So really, truthfully, between you, me, and the oncoming rain, um, you know, really we only really made, made ten grand. Yeah. So that's not a lot of money. I mean, and then the, and it costs us at least thirty thousand dollars per three episodes, at least. Mm -hmm. So that's a gap I have to make up somehow, and that's not easy. So yeah, crowdfunding is great, and it, it, I think the money is great. But of course, there's a percentage taken off by whomever you're crowdfunding with. Don't forget about that. It's usually around ten percent or twelve or thirteen if you add in the fees. Yeah. So that takes a lot, a lot away. Um, and then, you know, that may or may not be enough to do what you want to do. So then there's the really hard part which is asking individuals for more than $20, for asking somebody for a 1000 bucks or $5,000, and then what are they getting in exchange for that? Well, you know, on the filmmaking side, a big, giant sense of satisfaction. <laughs> you know, and knowing that they help make art, and, and it seems like, oh yeah, they, nobody's gonna give you money for that, but weirdly enough, you know, there's not that many people like us who, like, burst out of the morning with a ton of great ideas and actually put them into action. You know, that might seem like whatever, but I mean, I, I was thinking the other day, just thinking about this panel, I was like, oh my God, this weird pattern of sort of finding money in smaller chunks from everybody and larger amounts from individuals has been going on since my early 20s. Mm -hmm. You know, just, it's, it is a patron model. And I think I was embarrassed about it because it seemed so weird to like have someone give me money to do shit, you know? I mean, it's older than your 20s. I know, but it also <laughs> can be creepy, you know, for other reasons. But like, but you know, you figure it out, and then it starts to become something that is normal, and then you kind of start to cultivate those relationships. And and I, I wanted to touch on those things because though I absolutely, I ha we have to do crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is not only good for raising money, but also to develop your fan base yeah. and your network and to, and to cultivate your friend group into supporters. And and I do agree that it may not be saving the world, but let me tell you, it sure creates momentum. And if you're having a crowdfunding campaign, it can also be a really good like. Uh, counterpoint for press, mm -hmm. you know, to get people really aware of your project. And I'm a big promoter and getting things into the world and like, hammer it, hammer it. And, you know, having something like crowdfunding really gives people something to rally around. I have a question. Am I allowed to have a question? You're, you, <laughs> you are allowed to have a question. Hi, I'm Adrienne. I, something that you said that spins it in the direction of what doesn't suck about this, mm. that I'm curious about, and I think each one of you has, has an approach to answer this, when you begin to know that there are the people who are willing to spend a thousand dollars, and they they because they don't come up with the ideas and they're really happy about that, how do each of you cultivate 
that kind of relationship? Or what, what do you think in your head before you write the grant, assuming that those are the people that you're going to meet and you're going to show up? How do you foster those relationships and then nurture them so that you can continue doing your art? Because I imagine at whatever level you are successful at creating any money, that's part of the magic stuff, and I'd love to know more about that. Yeah. I feel like I um, I don't have a lot of experience applying for grants, like more professional funding avenues. A lot of the fundraising that I do is very much on the back of like people are investing in right. me, the person, not even necessarily the project that I'm putting out there. Mm -hmm. So the, a big part of it. the general tactic, I mean, and I, I say tactic, this is half natural and half cultivated, and that's kind of the rough thing is that you're talking about you know <coughs> turning friends into a fan base. Mm -hmm. I kind of, I am on a, a lot of social media platforms and I share a lot of myself. I have stopped using my personal Facebook page, really, mm. which is silly because, and this is the worst reason to think about it, is like, oh, but my personal Facebook page is rife with all these people who know me and care about me, but I could probably get a lot of money out of, you know, it's like, I don't want to think about it in those terms. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting to me that I have kind of forsaken people who I met in real life at some point and made friends with in a Facebooky kind of way for strangers that I have cultivated a friend-like relationship with over the internet. But generally, I, I try to cultivate those relationships like I would cultivate friendships. So I write to those people like people. You know, I keep them updated on what I'm up to. I ask them how they're doing. I find out about their lives. And it's not, uh, I, I try not to think about it as a Machiavellian kind of ploy because they know what is happening too. Like, I yeah. mean, they have, they have generally volunteered to give me more money. I have often put more expensive tiers on crowdfunding platforms because my fans have bullied me into doing so and said, we'd like to give you more money. And I say, I don't, that's silly. No, we would want, and they're like, just put it on there. We, we will do it. And then they do it. And those people, it's interesting because over time, I think I have developed more of a relationship. Like a lot of the time, the kinds of people who are interested in funding the arts and supporting independent creators are people that I would want to be friends with anyway. Um, and so it doesn't, it's no skin off my nose to cultivate friendships with those people. And it, 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 it is a weird, I don't know what the word is for someone who is a fan, who has become a friend, who is not quite wholly friends because they still financially support me, which can create a weird dynamic sometimes. Thankfully, you know, knock wood, it hasn't really gone too far in that direction yet. But it's a weird balance, but I would say that I treat them as people and I show a genuine interest in them and their lives and I try not to reduce them to like, what can I milk out of this person? Right. Um, one of the things on Patreon, the, the tier that people bullied me into making was a $50 tier. They didn't say, we want X for $50. Generally, people who support my work on Patreon are not looking for material remuneration in the way that they are on Kickstarter. They just like knowing that they're supporting the work that I make, which I feel very fortunate for. And those people, uh, I, I decided to offer a quarterly package. So I like curate a little, you know, I do a handwritten letter and I collect some things that I've worked on that quarter. and. I package them all up and send them out, and people love getting stuff in the mail. I mean, it's like, it's just like how you would cultivate a relationship with someone is make them feel special, because they really are. I mean, I, I talk and think about those people a lot, not just from a like, oh, thanks for paying my bills kind of way, but uh, it is a, it's an emotional bond, too, and I think you need to be willing to emotionally engage with those people rather than just treating them as budget line items. Mm -hmm. Totally. Well, and so uh, an organization like RAC can fill that role of being the, the money person mm -hmm. or the, the, the money place. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, how do you like to see artists cultivate relationships with the organization? Or how do you, how, do you, how, how should artists approach uh, an organization that is um, providing grants? Or coming back time after time to get additional grants, right? Well, um, to kind of follow up on you know talking about fundraising from your community and then um, fundraising from you know, the arts council or another funder. Um, when you're applying to RAC or an, another, there aren't a lot of resources out there for individual artists. But if you're applying to the Oregon Art Commission or the, um, the Regional Arts and Culture Council, you're going to be um, putting your you know putting your project, putting your um, your ideas into our application, you know, trying to articulate what your um, what your vision is, and you're always going to be filling out a budget to kind of outline how you're going to be supporting and uh, supporting and doing other fundraising to help um, raise the funds for that for that um, idea for that project. It will always be important to be looking to other resources like your community, your network, um, Kickstarter. Um, Patreon, other fundraising elements to help leverage that request 
of the public funds. It shows that you're not just relying on the public dollars from the grant. Um, scammers will tend to, if they see that there's no other investment, there isn't an investment from your community or your own, um, your, your own funding, that um, the project isn't gonna happen without the grant, and that usually doesn't seem like, it's, it, it can feel like, or can translate into, there isn't community interest, there isn't um, an audience. But if you're willing to um, think about the ticket sales, think about the um, other fundraising, that helps a panel feel confident that you are doing what you can to support your work, and usually translates into higher scores which um, through the process can end up with uh, public funds. So, I mean, one thing I just was thinking about what she was asking about in terms of viewing lack of a relationship. One, it's, it's, I think it's, it's different in that it's not an individual, it's an organization that brings on local artists to form a panel who then score applicants and right. decide as a team uh, you know, yeah. who's gonna get what amount. Yeah, Forgive me, when I, was, when I was asking, realizing that you have uh, people who are specific people you can think of. I meant when you're writing a grant, the kind of relationship or the kind of what you have in your mind as who your audience is when you're writing it. Yeah. It's this, like how you're cultivating a, a kind of energy of people who want to give you money. So you can assume, oh, grant are people that want to like, they want to they they extend this grant some, somewhere. And how do you present what, you're, what you have to offer to them in a way that's similar? Is that I think with, with any funder, again, I think this applies across the board, it's learning to speak the language of the folks that you're talking to. Like, Sweet. you know, the way that I, I talk to someone that donates five bucks to a crowd, crowdfunding, crowdfunding campaign is different than the more, you know, I have to, with Rack, I'm gonna lay out my budget and I'm gonna get detailed about, oh, I'm not gonna just say, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna tell people all the time, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna uh, post this this many times and I'm gonna, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's they're different, very different situations, but okay. but I know that um, this is the, these are the things that I know that Rack wants to see, and and I don't mean in an artificial way. I just meant like I'm gonna kind of categorize like this is this is what I know is important to them. Like they want to know that it's actually gonna happen. They want to know that I have the ability to make it happen. Um, and so how am I gonna talk about it to to prove that to them? I think Ingrid makes a really good point that. Uh, you are also, in both cases, creating in people a desire to buy. And everyone likes a winner. We've all seen crowdfunding campaigns that are written by people who are at the end of their tether, who are like, please for the love of God, just give me some money. And, so, and we don't want to give to those campaigns. You know, like the, the first campaign I ever ran uh, was for $1,200, which to me, when I was in college, seemed like an astronomical sum of money. And when I raised nearly 12,000, was then felt very insignificant, and I realized in retrospect that a lot of my good fortune in that campaign came from uh, presenting the page in a way that let people know I was serious. So I put a lot of time and effort and energy into making a video that looked really professional, and I had a budget and I had stuff, you know, it like, it let people know that even though this was my first campaign, I was going to make it happen, and they knew I was committed and that I took it seriously. And when I polled the people who were not personal friends who had backed the campaign, they always said, oh, you know, I watched the video, and that really sold me. And that stuck in my head as like, okay, so if you show people that you've got what it takes, and it may not be saying to them like, well, I've also got you know $12,000 in seed funding lined up to go and do some other thing with this, it might just be like, I've got a passionate, committed community of fans. I have this many followers on social media. Um, I have regularly self-published the following kinds of materials. Like, you're building a, a track record. And I was really concerned that once I'd hit my goal on that first campaign, no one would want to give me money because I'd raised the money I wanted, right? But people loved it because it felt like they were on this runaway train as the stars. It was so successful. Everybody felt really good about it. So you want to help people feel good that they are engaging with you. That they're participating. Yeah, they, they are, are, they are part instrumental. Of the, it's part of the fun. Well, uh, so you made a really good point about the video, and you, know, you, you guys have all seen the, the, the crowdfunding campaigns that work and don't work. You know, the ones that, that people sort of phone it in and put like a picture up and don't really do anything engaged, like we need money, we wanna make an album or a film, and then you see the ones that really spend time engaging you, and you're like, I can't say no. I just got my heart broken, and, and it's funny, I just, I, I had this experience just as someone who, as a funder the other day, 
where a friend of mine who's a musician posted her crowdfunding thing, and it was pretty much uncompelling. All my bandmates sang in a band, they, they were like, we want to give to her, but it was like, eh. And then, uh, <laughs> and then I ran into her, and I was like, D and she had done a post that was extremely personal, it was just for her friends on Facebook, like heroinly personal, explaining really what was going on, why she had stopped making music, and why she wanted to just to post, and I read that, and I was like, here's my money. I just like immediately, and I don't even like giving money to crowdfunding campaigns. I'm broke, I'm a filmmaker. You know, so I mean, I just like how they get made, though. It's all broke artists yeah. being like, oh, oh my God, God, take my money. Yeah, because, so hard. because <laughs> she compelled me, and I say this that it, it's like, I know it's hard. It's hard to put yourself out there, and it's especially hard to be vulnerable. And I have this issue, I think we all have this issue, like, but the best campaigns when you lay yourself on the line and you just like, look, guys, and, and this with Death Wizardry worked really, really, really well. Um, you know, we may not have raised a ton of money, but we raised enough to get the ball rolling. And then, and also remember, like, you know, we found money, money from people who have money, not even just crowdfunding, by just launching a crowdfunding campaign and saying, this is what we're doing. And, and one point I wanted to make, you know, beyond making a compelling video, which is key, or something that's compelling, and communicating to people in a way that feels like your best friend and you're giving them something that isn't just a, a line of, I need your money, but, um, what your crowdfunding, your project, bringing it back to that for a second. I mean, there's all kinds of projects. Some of them are gonna get attention, some of them aren't. You're gonna be lucky with some, you're not gonna be lucky with others. How to make sure maybe you have a chance. You know, think about what really, really matters to you. Like, is your project something that you cannot not do? You know, and when you're explaining it to your best friend, they're like, shit, I wanna help. You know, <laughs> like you need to sort of make sure what you're funding and what you're trying to make, you know, in my world, like I've experienced way better um, success when I happen, I mean, for better or worse, happen to choose something that's zeitgeisty. Mm -hmm. You know, the Desmond Dream compared to my short film, which we crowdfunded, which did okay, whatever, but I don't want anyone to see it. This one, <laughs> this one for me was a very much, a, you know, not just a story that mattered to me, but almost like, you know, a movement. Mm -hmm. I knew that, you know, Gay Straight Alliance and finding a way to sort of tell stories about people who love each other that are non-traditional, um, that you know, sort of plumb from my real life, things like that. I could sell that, mm -hmm. but not in a way that was selling. Like, I mean, I can sit and talk with you and you're just gonna be like, fuck yeah, I wanna see the show, because it is based on real stuff and it was the most vulnerable thing I've done, and you know, and I got to talk about that in the video, which mm -hmm. uh, we crowdfunded through Seed and Spark, which if you're a filmmaker specifically, they are a film-focused crowdfunding platform that also has a streaming cinema. So it's pretty cool. I don't know, Don, didn't you crowdfund through them the last time? Yeah, time? through Nonprofit, yes. I so, just backed my first project on there. Yeah. And that's interesting. Really they're interesting. they're yeah. awesome and um, you know, they're very interactive with their filmmakers. And also it's very focused on that art form. So you tend to get less lost in the shuffle that if you're on Indiegogo or Kickstarter or whatever. If you're a filmmaker, you know, you really want people to be focused on stuff. And, and it's funny, I had to take a workshop that basically said, you know, don't think you have to move to LA. This is two and a half years ago, you know, before it was easy to get your shit up on Amazon Prime DIY. Mm -hmm. But you know, you don't have to move to it. It can, you know, do it here. Like do it in Portland, do it where you're living, find a way to like make that project big. And if you're making a film specifically, you know, for less than a thousand dollars, before you get started, maybe even for nothing, you can bring together your friends with gear and a light or two and create that video. And, and, yeah. and, and, and you know, <laughs> always get lights. Yeah, by the way, always lights, even if it's on Amazon Prime or Ordell Prime, it's terrible now, right? But if you just get your, <laughs> I mean, it's, I can't, whatever. It's just like don't film it in a closet on your smartphone with your front facing camera and your hand over the microphone. But if you do, <laughs> at least you did that something. Like, you know, yeah. it, it, it's not <laughs> ideal. It's better to do a polished video that, like, represents who you are and, and like, has some sense of humor and represents your personality. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that are going to get funded probably the, the quickest. But like I said, my friend who, you know, didn't tell the world how she was feeling, but just her friends, you know, she, her campaign is not doing that well. You know, she's like at a six and she's got 10 days left. That's not good. Remember people usually give at the beginning, at the end, and the, mm -hmm. the middle is hell. But you have to keep <laughs> plugging. <laughs> Everybody, it's like, it's really hard. But you know, but that's when it matters. And that's, that's actually when you can make direct connections with people mm -hmm. and have a conversation about contributing toward the end. It's not all immediate satisfaction. Like you have to kind of build those relationships and ultimately cultivate, um, you know, those contributors. Yeah. 
I have a question about like maintaining passion for your project in the middle. <laughs> of what you might call this because I feel like this sounds like passion, like project passion killer stuff. You know, like it is. But you gotta like yeah. you got. I mean that that's being an artist. It yeah. is. Yeah. It is though because like people giving you money for your thing. That first crowdfunding campaign is the reason that I went straight into freelancing out of college because I've never had a real job because. I was like about to launch into the world and then put this crowdfunding campaign up and people, some of them who I'd never met before on the internet, yeah. gave me money, sometimes more than $5, you know? And that was like, it, it is a huge rush to see people choosing to invest in the work that you're putting up there. But what happens when they're not? When they're not investing, you doubt everything you've ever done and then you believe you're a failure. Uh, but then you make comics about it and then you crowdfund those comics and then you make a lot of money. No. <laughs> but again, that's also vulnerability based, so I feel like that's still the key. I also, I just want to come back to, I think that Rack is an amazing resource that not enough people take advantage of. And I know that before I applied the first time, like I was really intimidated mm -hmm. by the idea of applying for a grant and that I had something that could be worthy and that you know, I wasn't sure that I had like, proven myself. And um, I went to an information session and I also, they offered to look at it before I actually submitted it. Like I did all the things that they said that you could do to get help. I don't know if you still do those things. Oh, but, yeah. But that, I mean, it just is, like, just thinking about, like, comparing the two, because I've also, every time I've applied for a grant, I've also done crowdfunding as well to, you know, put it all together to make a, a bigger budget. And the crowdfunding is much harder. I think it's much, I think it's much more hard at the end of the day. I mean, it, it does take time to put together a grant, but those are also things you should be doing anyway. And it's all, I mean, for me, in terms of, like, having a well-thought-out project, like a film that's going to, I know it's going to take maybe a year to sort of, go through all the different stages and bring in different people and crews and post-production and all that stuff. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it, and it, it may not be easy, but um, when, you're, when you are excited about your project, if you can use those opportunities like building the crowdfunding campaign so that you're getting the word out, so that you're building momentum amongst your audience base, if, you are, um, if you're also you know, taking the time to uh, apply for a grant, and there are a lot of support at RAC for that for that step. You are um, you're in the grant application. You're writing about your project. You're thinking it through about how you're going to do your audience development. You're thinking about how you're going to make a budget. If you can use those other skills that you're building on that business side, that that funding side, to keep yourself focused on the art making, it can. I think you can kind of do it hand in hand. You can stay motivated by the project when you are also meeting the deadlines for the grant, when you're also thinking about your, um, you know, meeting your, your um, tier, tier obligations and crowdfunding. But you have to think of it as that, that business side, that, um, that hard work you have to do and that stretching your skills on that side as feeding your ability to make the project, the thing you're passionate about, come to fruition. Which also ties into the greater challenge of being an artist in general, which is distancing your own self-worth from your creative output, mm -hmm. which is something that a lot of us really struggle with, right? That the work that we produce is the measure of what we are worth on this planet. And if you put a dollar amount to that and then people aren't paying it, you're like, well, I'm trash. Everything is over forever. <laughs> and I think that's one of the things that treating your work as a business, um, with business milestones or as a day job, you know, it's at the start when passion is the driving force, like there's, you know, uh, commonplace wisdom that love is not enough to make relationships work. And I think love is not enough to make a career as a creator. It's enough to be an amateur, and I, I mean that word with all the love of the root of the word, um, which comes from Amare, to love. And to be in love with something and to pursue it passionately when you have a day job and it's just a thing you do on the side, there's no shame in that. And there's also no shame in being a professional artist and having a day job and getting to just do your art without the looming specter of having to make money from it, which can be a real enthusiasm killer. And I think we, we put a lot of weight sometimes on like, you're either independent or you're nothing, you know, you gotta like go hard. And I think that's a load of hooey. Um, I say as someone who's never had a normal job, but like even still, <laughs> I, I daydream about health insurance. Uh, I think that would be lovely to have a at some point in my life. Um, by the way, everybody sign up. Yeah, does everyone register? register on on there. Yeah. 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 Haven't already. Get on there, because Oregon does offer low income coverage. December 15th is the cutoff date. Tell your yep. friends, Tell people your friends on the street. Friends. There was one other thing I was going to say about, because we're all talking about crowdfunding, like this is the place that you go to, and even with the grant, you're doing work ahead of time, like you're proving to people that you have what it takes to apply for the grant. You, you hopefully have proved yourself in some regard, you have some track record. 
And I think with crowdfunding too, a lot of the time the notion is like you make the campaign and then the people materialize and give you money. And I think crowdfunding is way more effective when people are like chomping at the bit. They are waiting for the opportunity to hit that pledge button. And it means cultivating an audience outside of crowdfunding campaigns or platforms and like waiting for the right moment to, to make that opportunity available. So the thing with the Demon Project that was really great was that I had posted a comic every day for 100 days, which from a mercenary standpoint is 100 days of promotion. And then on the 100th day, I hit launch on that campaign and it funded totally out of order, you know, and then like went on to raise a bunch more money. And that is not a coincidence. I think that's a direct result of people had created an emotional bond and they were invested and they were whatever. So being able to share yourself, not just in a heartfelt plea on your crowdfunding page, but also like in your Facebook posts to your friends or on Twitter or like getting interested in making your process accessible and transparent to the community that wants to support you uh, is just as much a big thing because that's also what a, a funder can look at and say, oh, you're doing the work and not just, do it. I think there's almost less barrier to launching a Kickstarter than there is to applying for a grant because we all carry imposter syndrome because we all think like, oh, I shouldn't bother to, and if it is taken advantage of as little as you say, then the competition is probably actually less steep than it is to get a campaign funded on Kickstarter. Well, maybe somebody should run out. <laughs> Just to, to talk about grant funding briefly. Um, so the Regional Arts and Culture Council is funded through public funds, primarily through the city of Portland and then through the local county. And as Don um, said earlier, we run the process to um, allocate the grant funds, but the people sitting on the panels are your fellow artists, arts administrators from the community. It's, it is community members coming together, reading the grants and um, scoring them based on criteria, but, but in the end, making the final decisions. There is never enough funds to, to go around. They do, it is a competitive process and hard decisions have to be made, but there is a lot to be said by um, to stepping forward and applying, learning by doing. I think getting in there and writing applications is one of the best ways to kind of hone your voice, learn mm -hmm. who, you know, how to speak to the audience of, of, of a funder and community panels. And um, one of the things, you know, RAC does a lot. We, we try to um, support people through the process because you're at least learning about grant writing, you know, attending an orientation as Don has, um, you know, coming in, you can meet with me, you can read. Um, past applications. Um, uh, Alicia has also received RAC grants and built a relationship so that she's, you know, um, getting feedback from the panel process and and learning what, you know, how to um, how to craft an application. And even if you aren't funded, you've done this all. Even if you aren't funded, you've done a lot of work and and outlined your project, so you have a roadmap for going forward. And you can always, um, you know. It, adjust that, edit it, make changes, and come back in a future cycle. And we've certainly seen people um, um, send in an application, it's not funded in that cycle, but learn from it and gain, um, you know, gain experience in grant writing and come back in the future cycle and be one of the top ranked proposals. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, it's, you know, I'd say nine times out of 10, it's not about your project concept. You're the artist, if you have the passion there, it's about how do you write about it in a grant application that translates that passion mm -hmm. to um, to the panel. I, I, have, I have a question too about asking for money, like when <coughs> I'm guessing you want people to show a budget. Mm -hmm. Like, do you have any like, do you have any helpful hints on how to like present that budget, I guess, in a way? Um, when I fill out applications, for example, I'm afraid that if I put too much money, they'll turn it down. If you put too little, they might not take you serious. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like, what do you have? What are your thoughts? Well, um, the rack application is broken down into artist fees and and, and um, art making um, costs, administrative and promotion and marketing. There's there's always expenses, even if it's your own time that's being donated in art artistic expenses, administrative, and promotion. So um, when it comes to paying yourself, when it, for RAC, when a panel is looking at it, they want you to see paying yourself at least part of that budget. Um, 
there's no like magic answer to that, but um, you, you some a lot of artists have to think of that in the um, stipend because you're going to be putting hundreds of unpaid hours into whatever project you're doing. Um, depending on your discipline, it can be um, you know as we said in the, um, in orientations like musicians are paid union wages and that and that's a lot more than in theater where you're if you're an actor you're lucky to get 200 bucks for your time on a project um, but what's important is that you're thinking you're giving yourself something in that budget mm -hmm. you know in general that's a couple thousand dollars for your time at least value your work on that project although you know as I'm sure everybody would say that's nothing compared to the months of time you're going to be putting into the final work. I, I don't know how true this is when it comes to grant applications, but I know um, when people share budgets, when they're crowdfunding or fundraising in general, um, if they haven't done the work to talk to other people about how much it costs to make this thing go, um, and their, their budget doesn't appropriately <laughs> allocate money for the real cost, that's a really big red flag to me that they're not going to be able to see the project through. Um, I see a lot of uh, comics related fundraising campaigns. And so if they haven't done the, if they haven't gone through the process of costing out what printing looks like, what shipping looks like, mm -hmm. and they're doing these guesses, um, that's, a, you, that's a really good indication to me that you might be successful in raising this money, but you might not be successful in getting the project all the way through. So I always encourage people who are starting a project or probably is a really good advice if they're applying for a grant, mm -hmm. um, go out and interview your peers mm -hmm. or people who have done this thing, something similar before, and ask them about the budget process and what it really looks like and to the extent that you can cost things out. Do a little bit of that because it will communicate to the audience that you're serious about this and that this is not a hope and a prayer. This is uh, a, a plan that you have and that you know how to, to execute on. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to comment on that as well. Um, I, I think that's definitely true about you want to make, if you're going to be reviewed, like in this particular grant process and, and other types of grants as well, you're going to be reviewed by people who are your peers and know what it costs to put something together. So you need to demonstrate that you understand that as well. But obviously any project can be done at different levels. You know, for a film, you know, I could spend hundred thousand dollars on 30 seconds for a commercial or <laughs> or seven thousand you know or, you know so um, I think it's just about looking at your overall budget as well you know what percentage are you asking a funder to give compared to your crowdfunding campaign compared to another grant you're applying for like I think those numbers like are connected so in terms of you showing that you're not just going to a single source um, or particularly with funders I think they like to see that there's other ways Uh, uh, sorry, here and then we'll go right back. Um, I'm wondering how how do you determine how much to pay for the labor of yourselves and the people that you work with? I think that what you said about the stipend idea um, is something that I've put into grants. Like it never actually covers the work. If you're someone who's kind of a creator behind something or at a, a higher level, I'd say. It, for in what I do, it's rare that you actually get paid for your, your time. Um, and, and if it's going to happen, it could happen on the back end if you're in like a solo film or something. So I think it depends on the type of project as well. Um, I'll weigh in on that end as well. You know, I made a choice for better or for worse to not get paid with my project, which is a TV show. Um, it was a suggestion that was given to me upon the first crowdfunding campaign. Like, look, you're going to make this much. Maybe you'll make the full 25. Maybe you'll make less. With filmmaking, it's really hard. And you know, if I take any amount out, that's too much. But what I do have is I own it. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was a sacrifice I was willing to make. And in the end, if I sell my show or if something happens, I'm the only one that's sort of in the queue to really make money off that intellectual property. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's important. And look, I, I, I wanted to pay myself so badly. I, <laughs> like, I wish I could pay myself. I basically just throw money into a black hole for the past few years. But, um, but that's, you know, it's important to me. I'm passionate about it. This is like, for me, as a filmmaker, defines me as the auteur I want to be. It gives me a, a, um, a launching point for my career that nobody was going to give me. 
that I had to make. And I wanted to make something big and epic that showed my stripes the way I wanted to show them. And I applied for grants, and I don't want to get too into this, because Ingrid and I have had some <laughs> sad, <laughs> sad hearts of hearts. And I really believe in the granting system and RAC, and I've been on grant panels more than once, and I've helped give people shit tons of money. And I'm, I love that part of the process, but I've also had my heart broken a bunch with this project and with other projects, and it's been tough. And it's made me not want to make projects. I mean, and that's just, I don't, I mean, I know grants are amazing, and I want them, but I don't usually get them, because my projects are weird, or they're maybe, I don't know how to write about them. I tried, I figured out. <laughs> Whatever, but like, I don't even care anymore. I'll figure it out any other way. But, and I did get a grant recently that was from a general grant to make a new website, which was incredibly helpful. And my website's almost done, and I think that will help me um, in my career. You know, that's really what's lacking. Like, I have no problem making creative stuff, but how do I survive, you know? Yeah, and, exactly. and, and in a two-year or two-year-plus project like this, when you're, which isn't done, we're in the middle of God knows how long this is going to go on, which is the beauty of episodic. But in the middle of all this, I've got to support myself. So, you know, RAC for me has wound up being something that's helped me on a career level instead of specific because I'm an early adopter and when I brought this project to RAC, they're like, we don't know what a web series is. Yeah, that's true. And that, that's something to think about too. Like, I'm always thinking I'm behind, but I'm usually ahead. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way my weird brain works. And so oftentimes I'll create something, I'm like, this is what needs to happen right now, and it should have been done five years ago. People are like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh. So yeah, learning how to talk about your projects. I definitely am not someone that, you know, takes, I didn't take full advantage of some of the workshops that RAC offers to really tell you how to talk about your work and how to write about your work, which is definitely a, a, an art form in and of itself. I, I, it's not something I really learned along the way. I'm more of a scrappy, like, passion seller, you know, and that's not exactly the approach. Uh, from, it hasn't worked for me, at least, with RAC, so it's it's complicated, but I'm, I'm I'm moving on. Um, <laughs> see, I can say, like, from a very nitty gritty perspective, uh, figure out how much you need to live in a given month. This is like maybe a, an important place to start. Get a spreadsheet and write down every dollar that leaves your checking account for the course of one month. When I set up my Patreon page, which is an ongoing crowdfunding platform where people pay me money every month to keep making work, I very deliberately established goals that were not creative milestones. They were, you're going to pay for my utilities, and then you're going to pay for my health care, and then you're going to pay for my rent. And then you're gonna pay for, you know, it's like I broke down how much it costs for me to live month to month. And I've been on Patreon, I was a fairly early adopter, so I've been there for three years or so now. And it started around $200 a month because I had a fan base extant who wanted to support me and has grown maybe like five or six to $20 a month. It's slow, it's not a Kickstarter campaign. But it is now at a point where I get about $1,200 a month reliably, and that's enough to cover my basic expenses. And that is how I pay myself for my time. That's how I justify doing a Kickstarter and not paying myself for the hours of labor that I put into doing that. When it comes to other people, I pay them fairly to the best of my ability. If they're friends and they want to donate their time, I still try and pay them something because I think that what we do is worth money and if we're not going to value ourselves, we have to value each other and it's worth paying your friends. Yay. We've got 12 minutes. Okay. Uh, so we're going to we're going to we're going to provide our our greatest fastest wisdom. Um, <laughs> My question was kind of in regards to budgeting and if anyone has advice on dealing with like the catch-22 situation you sometimes run into. For me, it's been like music licensing, mm -hmm. where the music licensing company essentially won't talk to me until I have a date and a venue, and I can't really put together my budget because I probably can't necessarily. So about music, yeah. for what kind of event, like an event? For, um, for a performance project. Oh, a performance project. Which that music licensing itself, I have a band on that. That's um, performance rights specifically. Mm -hmm. So tracking down, I mean, it's one thing to track down who actually holds the rights, but then they don't really want to give you any information without very specific. Mm -hmm. um, so then putting together a budget is difficult, and then like scheduling a theater is difficult because you're like, oh, what if I don't get the funding? But it's like situations like that where you're like, how do I? I think you just gotta eyeball. You know, at, at that point, you can only really sort of guesstimate what it's gonna be, mm -hmm. and then Rack is cool with that. I think generally, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. I but mean, it's never gonna change. Yeah, it's yeah. Change. It's never set in stone. I mean, and and honestly, like you may have your heart set on track X or thing X, but you say you're gonna have five hundred dollars that goes toward it. You'll figure it out if you get that five hundred bucks. You'll find someone to work within it. It might have to be local, not exactly what you thought at the beginning, but you make it work. We do something. This is filmmaking very briefly. We do something called MFA. 
most favored nation. So we offer people X amount per track, no more. And it could be a fancy band or a not fancy band, they're all getting paid the same. Somehow they agree to it and it's fine. And that's, you know, on a, a more like web-based thing, if we sell our show, they could get more money and so on and so forth. But I think you can be sort of general on that level because nobody, I mean, you're right, they make it difficult to tell you exactly what it's gonna cost, but you can sort of get a ballpark from them. Mm -hmm. Usually they'll give you, they'll be kind enough to give you a ballpark. Well, it's gonna cost you no less than $500, no more than 5,000. You're like, Jesus Christ. But at least it gives you an idea of the scale, you know? All right, back. Uh, for those who've done uh, Patreon uh, more, I'm, I'm curious as to like what kinds of things besides being, you know, saying you're doing what you say you're gonna do, what are some other things that you think you've um, been able to keep those supporters on, and how, how have you done that? I tell you right now, I am recording this panel, and I will be posting it for my patrons when this is over. Um, I write essays about, uh, I, I tend to do weekly check-ins about what's going on with me. It has fluctuated. Sometimes I don't have time to do work for Patreon on top of my own creative work. Sure. But uh, Patreon generally is a place where I am a little more candid with people than I am on the internet, which is saying something because I'm pretty all out there on the internet. Mm -hmm. but. It is good to have a space where you can delve, I think for your own creative process as well as for your patrons, delve a little more deeply into what you're struggling with and why. And if it's a question of like, how do you make a budget? I'm learning this as I go and I can share that with people. The stuff that you think is commonplace is probably rocket science to someone else and they would love to hear about it. In terms of practical things, I scan all my sketchbook work every month and I put a little PDF up for patrons. I have a Dropbox full of PDFs of existing comics that I've made. I record podcasts like, podcasts, very casual conversations with friends of mine and put them up for people to listen to and learn from. Uh, I used to write postcards to 10 people every month and tool handwritten postcards, but that's a lot of work, so I stopped doing that. I think less work, uh, more Patreon support. That's that's my goal. Uh, and people who support on Patreon are generally like that, so. Can I make, just because Tana, I don't think you guys have time to address this individually, but I just wanna, because what you just talked about, I think is crucial. Every crowdfunding platform has a really different culture to it, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you can't approach Patreon the same way that you approach Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And Kickstarter has changed a lot over time. I don't think people are looking for a lot of physical extra goodies anymore as rewards on Kickstarter. So I don't think you have time to address that all those all individually, but I think I you just did. Like that's it. Yeah. Like whatever <laughs> platform you're looking at, make sure you understand the culture of that platform and go look at the yeah. successful crowdfunding campaigns on that platform. See what those people are offering and how it's unique to them and how it's different from what's on the other platforms. Yeah, great advice. Oh, yeah. I was just wondering, um, is there, we're talking a lot about grants and crowdfunding, and is there a specific point in your creative process where, okay, now it's time to do a crowdfunding campaign, now it's time to do the grant. Um, you know, just wondering if we need a finished product and you're ready for the next stage, or is it maybe early on in the process? It, I think it can depend. I think <laughs> It depends on the project and like what your time frame is. I will say one thing, try to crowdfund within the same calendar year that you're gonna actually make your project. Mm -hmm. oh, then yes. you yes. I've made that mistake because then you wanna pay taxes on money you're gonna use and more than use, and it puts you in a negative position. But there's so, a way around it that you have to take care of money. Yeah. Oh, there is? Yes. Yes. Also get an account. Yeah, it's a business <laughs> for it, yeah. It's very important. Yeah. I personally, I get really stressed out at the prospect of people having already paid me for work that I have not done yet that is creative in nature. So, mm -hmm. like, these comics, I completed the comics, and then I went to Kickstarter to say, like, it's time to make this a thing. I would like you to front the cost of production for thing. Mm -hmm. And some people don't work like that. For some people, it's like, I want to write a novel. Kickstarter, give me the money to support myself while I write this novel. That's a lot more difficult of a thing to sell. So for me, it's often like, do I, I generally it's because I don't have a lot of liquid capital myself, um, or any kind of solid capital, I don't know, squishy capital, there's none of it. Uh, so if I need money to make the next stage happen, that's generally when it's timed. Like if it's ready, if I've made a connection with the community and then I need their help to get over the next hurdle, that's often when crowdfunding is right for me personally. Uh, that money can be a very stressful wait. I think it depends on the type of, what type of project you're talking about. Uh, I'm a performance artist. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's like anything, it's having a timeline. I mean, I, it's, it's sort of unfair to do crowdfunding and to subject your friends to if you don't know when you're going to do your project. Yeah. So yeah. I would definitely like have a plan and know when, like you're going to perform it in September. Well, crowdfund it with enough time that you can have time to be in the grant cycle and in the crowdfunding cycle and give yourself enough time to like put your things together, but then have a good enough idea of what you're going to do that you can actually sell it. I mean, sell it to your friends 
and get people excited about it. So you've got to have your concepts sorted, I think, before you get into yeah. the process. Yeah. If, yeah, you, that's if you try yeah. to crowdfund with kind of a half-baked idea, it's going to waste everybody's time. I would also look at what other folks in the same category. Like what oh, is yeah, typical yeah. with film? It's very common to do it in the pre-production when you, you know, might have an idea with some folks on board and, you and do a timeline. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. but also it's also common to do a post-production. Like so, there's like yeah. things that people are used to that um, might make it seem more credible if that's they know like that's how you do it. Yeah, there, yeah. there are the subcultures I think of, of fundraising based on what your area is and what type of project it is, and so looking to see who else has been successful, to Anana's point, paying attention to the culture of the mm -hmm. platform and of your particular uh, type of creation can help inform those decisions. Dance campaigns on Kickstarter and comics campaigns on Kickstarter generally look very different. Yeah. Uh, I saw a question here. Oh, I was just gonna, you, you mentioned a website that, that funds on a monthly basis. Yeah. What is that? It is called Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. <coughs> and it's been around for probably four or five years now, I want to say. And uh, it's I I am a big fan because it is the the closest thing to a regular paycheck I've ever had now, and I'm super into that. <laughs> but you but but I'll say it failed for me. Oh. And it's not easy to do unless you're like you and have a lot of energy and, <laughs> and, and when you're able to really keep it going. Ghost a morning person. Yeah. 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 I was just like, if I see a ten o'clock tonight, I will be like, unconscious. It did not. I was. It was just way too hard to keep up with for me. I just couldn't. It was not a model to work. So you know, when you're trying to engage your fans, it might be a different platform. Yeah, so the way that your energy matches up. Yeah, you got to yeah. match your energy. Patreon might be great if you're working in sort of like an exchange with your fan base and you can do what you do every yeah. day. I like I like going deeper with people and yeah. I can't predict what projects I'm going to be doing. And they are often weird and cool in nature, but not always. You know, someone will call and say, like, do you want to go spend three weeks in the Pacific Ocean learning about oceanography and make a comic about that? And I have to say yes and then go two months later. But having Patreon means that those people are just kind of along for the ride for whatever comes up. It's not like I am paying you twelve dollars a month to continue producing your web series that you make on the regular. That you know, it's like but, kind but, of a different. But you've got to make sure that you. One of the most important things is also keeping track of your fans. So creating a mailing list, creating a subscription base, creating a, a people that you can go back to if you're crowdfunding again for the next project or the next phase of your project. I can't make like. Just say that's important enough because people will just sort of go through the process and wind up with this sort of nothing at the end. And what you can really wind up with, minus money, are email addresses. <laughs> yes. And email addresses are cool because the more of those you get, then yeah. suddenly you have 500, you have 1,000, you have 2,000. My friend Holcomb Waller once said, he's another amazing musician, or he's a musician who's you know crowdfunded many times. He goes, Look, if you have a thousand people who give a shit about what you do, you can do anything. Yep. So cultivate those thousand people. It's not impossible. It's not a hundred thousand people. Nope. It's not the world. It's a thousand people. It seems like a lot, but some of you probably have over a thousand Facebook friends, I would imagine. So or Twitter followers or whatever. So turning those people into supporters and respecting them in the process and giving them something, being vulnerable and relating to them, that'll give them, I think, a reason to sort of feel for your pain and your project and want to support it. Yeah. <laughs> So we've got, I love that advice, uh, and that gives me the idea we've got two minutes. Uh, I would love it if, wow. Uh, get, like, your, your gym piece of advice in 20 seconds or less. Uh, um, don't be afraid to apply for grants, but give yourself the time to, to, as we've said, learn about the process, attend an orientation, take advantage of the support and resources at RAC, and um, look to learn from it, even if there isn't money from it at the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, be, be passionate enough about your project to uh, use that to drive through the barriers that might present as you uh, figure out how to, to raise money and learn that skill set. Also, I have a short film screening on December 3rd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Street Theater, come up and grab a, a script. Yeah. Cool. I also have cards that you can come and take, and comics you can take for free as well. Um, Everybody is screwed up about money in some way or another. It is the, probably the biggest nexus of shame. People are way more interested to talk about what their favorite sexual position is than reveal how much they make. We're all figuring it out as we go. You have nothing to be ashamed of. Talk to each other. Like, really talk to each other about how money makes you feel. I was crying last night because I'm having imposter syndrome feelings about money right now, and I'm like stressed out about healthcare and all this other stuff. That is normal. Most people are going through some permutation of that. Maybe their problem is they have too much money. You can help them with that. But like, <laughs> be willing to share with one another and don't, it is, you have nothing to be ashamed of. You really don't.
Um, dream big. And I mean bigger than you used to dream in. Like, have giant ideas. Don't be afraid, okay? Like, give it to yourself. Like, give yourself that gift. But you can start small to make them a reality. So, have giant ideas. I want you guys to all, like, take over the world really soon. And on that note, um, so, <laughs> so uh, the benefits of Gotham Dream, my weird little TV show, is available on Amazon Prime, which, uh, so that's almost like the classic YouTube. It's sort of free. And then <laughs> Vimeo On Demand, and also through Stephen Spark Cinema, which I highly recommend you listen to if you're a filmmaker. Uh, they have their own streaming platform, and uh, filmmakers actually make a lot more than on Amazon, which is sort of like pennies. So, uh, so please go to the benefits of You can find out information, um, and you know, just like I said, don't be afraid to have big ideas in this weird. It seems it seems like it's such a cluttered landscape, but good ideas always rise to the top. And if you've got a good one, if it's from the heart, if it's something that like resonates with who you are, it's you on a platter. That's the idea people are going to give you money for. Can I say one more thing? Yeah. Follow Katie Lane. Uh, we did not get to hear a lot from Katie, but yeah. Katie is a killer negotiation coach and an incredible financial resource. And her blog is at workmadeforhire.net. And if you yeah. grab one of the pink programs on the table on your way out, they have everyone's bios and websites in them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and Katie's stuff is invaluable. So well, really, you. really do go follow her also. Thank you, thank you. and thank you all for coming. Uh, a round of applause for our panel.